The session is going to be comprised of three talks, three short 25-minute talks. And it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this session, Andrei Dimov. And he's going to talk about freezing effects in a network of oscillators coupled to thermostats of finite energy. Uh, please, Andrei. Yes, thank you for the invitation. And first, I should apologize that I almost do not participate in the conference. I just participate only in one on two talks because I have the exams all the time. And when it is online, it takes, takes infinity, uh, take really infinite time. So uh, today, I will, I will speak about my not new work. This is, this is a paper of 2018 because, because the last two conferences, I talked about some, some effects in the right turbulence, and I still keep working on these problems, but, but new results are not still in good shape to speak about them. And also to make some difference, I decided to, to, to speak about some different problem. It, it, is, not, it is not very, very new, but, but uh, I have never spoken about this here. So, and actually it is not, it is not too, too like, uh, complicated in the technical point of view. So, so it's possible to explain in 25 minutes, I hope so. So my motivation was, so yeah, first I will explain my motivation and, and uh, here I will not write almost any formula, uh, uh, but then I will define accurately all objects that, that I use. My motivation uh, comes somehow from, from problem of statistical physics. Let us consider a chain. Do, do you see my mouse? Yeah, so, so uh, yes, perfectly. Let us consider a chain of oscillators, this one, uh, which consists of a finite number of oscillators. They interact between each other via some interaction potential. In general, the interaction potential are nonlinear. That is the equation of motion. That is are not quadratic. So the interaction, uh, the equations of motion are not, not linear. Uh, and this is, this is a classical model for people who study statistical mechanics of crystals because it's uh, simple from one hand and from another hand, it keeps some trace of, of the crystalline lattice in the sense that each oscillator, so each particle interacts only with, uh, with fixed neighbors. For example, this oscillator always interacts with this one and with this one, and this is somehow structure of crystalline lattice. And usual game which, which play people from statistical mechanics uh, is the following. Let us couple this chain of oscillators with two thermal baths or thermostates, which is the same. And I draw them in such a way, I'll explain why. So one thermostate is coupled with the first oscillator and another thermostate coupled with oscillator with number N, this is, this is N actually. This is n. N is the number of oscillators. Uh, uh, and then let us assume that these thermal bus have some temperatures T L and T R. If you work on non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, you assume that the temperatures are different, and then you are interested what is going on in this system. Do you have some energy transfer through the chain of oscillators from the left? thermal bus to the right thermal bus. Uh, uh, and there are different models of the thermal bus. One of, uh, one of popular model uh, is the following. You take a, a continuum of harmonic oscillators parameterized by their inter internal frequency. L later I'll write formula for this, for this model. So it will be, I, I think it will be simpler to understand looking at formulas, but, but now I'll uh, say this in words. So we take continuum of oscillators parameterized by their internal frequency. That the oscillators are harmonic. The coupling of these oscillators with this one, with this oscillator from the chain, uh, is linear. And then you assume that uh, what what is the temperature in this case? The temperature is the following. You assume that the initial condition of oscillators from the thermostate are distributed accordingly to the Gibbs measure uh, with temperature T L. And here is the same, but with the temperature T, Tr. Uh, and now let me let me call by Q coordinates of the oscillators, and actually assume that each oscillator is one dimensional. It's it's also also a usual story for for, for these problems. 
uh, by p moments of these oscillators. Uh, so then this is a vector from R to N, where N is the number of oscillators. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, then the first question which people ask for such systems, what is going on when time goes to infinity? And uh, one of the, the first result, the first result, uh, which was about nonlinear system because, because nonlinear systems of oscillators are of special interest, uh, uh, was that the distribution, this D denotes the distribution of this vector, uh, which describes the, this finite dimensional system of oscillators, converts when time goes to infinity to a unique stationary measure of the system. The stationary measure is non-trivial and then, then people, uh, so, so when time is large, you arrive at stationary regime. Uh, and, and in this stationary regime, actually you can observe some, some transport of energy from the, left, from, from the left thermal bus to the right thermal bus if the left temperature is larger than, than the right temperature. So because of the, because of the uh, assumption on the initial condition that, I distribu that they are distributed accordingly to the Gibbs measure with these temperatures, the initial energy of the thermostates is almost surely infinite, actually. So if you, if you, if you look at this energy, it's almost surely infinite. Uh, uh, and I asked the following question. Okay, what if we do, what, what, will we, what will we observe if we do the same thing, but in the case when the energy of these thermostats, thermostates is finite? So this is somehow was, was my, my motivation. Actually, it was it was not like this. I just understood that I can solve this problem, but by by some methods. <laughs> uh, and and, and then, then, then I started to started to study this question. But but the question seemed to me to be quite natural. And and then then I proved the following thing. So since I assume that the initial uh, that the energy is is finite. Uh, I do not need any randomness here. So, and, and I will not have any randomness. I just take any initial conditions for these thermostates, any initial conditions, but such that the initial energy of the system is finite. Then you obtain an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. Actually, I will, I will work with, with Lagrangian systems, but that's quite the same. And, and uh, uh, energy of the total system is also conserved. It, it, it is also finite and, and is conserved. And uh, then I prove that when time goes to infinity, the coordinate and momentum of the oscillators from this, this finite chain just, just tends to, so the oscillator just stop. So the momentum just goes to zero when time goes to infinity and the coordinate just goes to some fixed point uh, and the convergence holds as well when time goes to minus infinity and to plus infinity. And uh, these vectors Q plus minus, these are critical points of some effective potential. So you have some, some explicit uh, final dynamics, but which is trivial, which is not like, like in the case where of, of, of infinite energy, but which is, which is somehow trivial. What does it mean? It means that actually in this infinite dimensional system, you have some effective dissipation because, because the energy is conserved, but, but nevertheless, nevertheless you, you arrive at some, at some explicit stationary, stationary regime. This happens in fact, because, because the thermostates, they absorb the energy and, and it, it goes to infinity. So, so you, have, you, you have a kind of radiation. And uh, the next question is the following. Okay, if we, if we arrived at equilibrium, so one could expect that, that this equilibrium, uh, this is also thermal equilibrium. So the, the, the energies of the thermostates become, become equal. Uh, so that, 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 that you stopped after, after the energy exchange stopped. But it seems that it isn't the case actually. So I can prove here, I can rigorously consider only simple situation when this chain of oscillator consists of only one oscillator, 
but already in this situation, so you have one oscillator which couples to two thermostates. Already in this situation, uh, I can show that the energy of the left thermostate converts to some limit. The energy of the right thermostate converts to some limit, but these limits are different for generic initial conditions. So uh, this is a kind of freezing effect, and and somehow somehow you can you can think that in the situation when the energy of thermostats was infinite, in this one the chain works as a conductor, and in this situation of finite energy, the chain works as a, as, as an oscillator. Uh, but but actually actually this 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 is like like. Uh, an interesting grammar, but actually this means just for me this means just just that uh, this system, this kind of systems with oh sorry with finite energy, they are not relevant for statistical mechanical problems because we observe what what we do not expect. <laughs> so this was was a kind of motivation, and and then I will I will rigorously explain this story. I'll explain this story, and I, I will not touch I will not touch the story of infinite energy. So. Uh, what is the system of oscillators? Actually, I consider a much more general situation. I consider not not a chain of oscillators. I consider I consider any any network of oscillators. So you see, you have some network of oscillators uh, which are situated on vertices of finite undirected graph, which I call this uh, letter J. Uh, and uh, this is a Lagrangian system with such such a Lagrangian. So I mean, on this conference, there are a lot of people who make probability and do not see Lagrangian systems every day, but below I'll write the equations of motion. Actually, I use only equations of motion and not, not, not the Lagrangian, but still I write the Lagrangian. Uh, so you have kinetic energy of each oscillator. I assume oscillators to have equal mass equal to one for simplicity. Each oscillator can has its own potential energy. So you can think that it's coupled by some spring to a wall, like, like, like here and like here. And also you have the interaction potential. Uh, only oscillators from adjacent ver vertices of the graph uh, interact. And without loss of generality, I assume that these functions, they are symmetric in such sense. So th 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 I do not, do not lose the generality. The number of oscillators equals to, to the number of vertices in the graph. Uh, so the equations of motion, you have just Lagrangian equations of motion. Uh, uh, prime, this is derivative of these functions, and I take arbitrary initial conditions. I fix them. Uh, next, what is thermostate? Uh, first, I couple not all oscillators with thermostates, of course. In the chain, for example, I couple only first and left oscillators with thermostates. And here, I fix some subregion lambda in some region lambda in my graph. And only oscillators from this region lambda I couple with with thermostates, like for example, if this is my graph, I can couple with thermostate this one and and this one. For the moment, lambda is arbitrary, but but then I will impose some some assumptions on this lambda. Uh, each thermostate is an infinite dimensional linear Lagrangian system, which is just as I told, continual collection of of independent harmonic oscillators parameterized by their internal frequency. So it's given by such a Lagrangian. So this in integral from minus infinity to infinity, psi m squared minus mu squared psi m squared. So mu is the internal frequency. Psi m and psi m dot uh, coordinate and velocity of the oscillator with internal frequency mu. Uh, uh, it would be more natural to insert here in the integral some some function which which describes the density of the oscillators on on uh, given internal frequency. But but you can you can kill this function by a simple transformation. So I do not I do not uh, do this. Equations of motion are simple. You have just continuum collection of independent harmonic oscillators parameterized by mu, and you you uh, I, I fix I fix uh, some just arbitrary for the moment initial conditions. Then I describe the interaction between the oscillator and the thermostates. Uh, I assume that it's linear and given by the following interaction potential. By the following interaction potential. Uh, so it's just, just quite general linear interaction. 
the interaction is provided by function kappa m and kappa m of mu describes describes like the rate of interaction between the oscillator with number m with its with its thermostate with its thermostate uh, functions kappa m the all, all my functions are smooth and the functions kappa m should decay at infinity sufficiently sufficiently fast uh, then the total system has the following equations of motion. Uh, this is the Lagrangian of my, my system. So it's sum of, of Lagrangians uh, minus interaction potential. Uh, I have system of oscillators. This is my, 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 my system, my finite dimension system of oscillators. These are my thermostates. And these terms, this one and this one, they describe the coupling. Uh, so here you see that that you have the the U M acts actually as an as an internal force on this oscillator, uh, as external force on these oscillators from from the thermostate, and this delta J lambda this is a Kronecker delta so it's equal to one if number J belongs to the region lambda and equals to zero otherwise and I recall that that only oscillators from region lambda are coupled with thermostates. So, so the terms describe the coupling of oscillators with term states. And I have some initial conditions. So, and I'm interested in solution of the system and, and its behavior when time goes to infinity uh, and to minus infinity. So I need some assumptions. I need some assumptions. Uh, I, I, here I mentioned only main assumptions uh, there are some other technical assumptions. Uh, so first, the coupling between thermostates and oscillators should be sufficiently strong. So it means that the function, the functions kappa m, which describe this coupling, they can vanish only at zero, and at zero they vanish because what is the oscillator with, with zero internal frequency? This isn't clear. So so at zero they should vanish, but but they cannot vanish for any other mu. I assume I, I already told that the functions kappa m should decay sufficiently fast. In particular, this integral should converge at zero. I have no singularity because of this assumption. Uh, and I assume that this integral converges and call it k m large. So somehow you can think about this integral as, as about like, like integral input of the thermostates to the chain. Uh, and I consider, I consider the following interaction potential, uh, the following sorry effective potential, which equals to interaction poten to, to, to the potential of my finite dimensional system of oscillators minus minus such a quadratic term where km is this km which comes from the thermostate. Uh, I assume that this effective potential has only isolated critical points and, and goes to infinity when q goes to infinity. Actually, I I think that this absolute value is a misprint, sorry. Uh, then I assume that I, I call the energy of the thermostate with number m uh, such function. So this is indeed the energy of, of the thermostate with number m. Its term describes its kinetic energy. So this is the kinetic energy of the oscillator from the thermostate with internal frequency nu, uh, nu, nu. And I integrate over all nu. And this is the potential energy. And I assume that the initial conditions are such, sorry, are such that, that uh, the initial energy of thermostates is finite. That, 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 that's the main assumption of what, what, what I told in the beginning. So first, first uh, it isn't obvious that the system has, has solutions because it's an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian systems, but it, but it has, uh, this isn't my result. This is, this is a result from previous work, which I will mention below. Uh, 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 so we have a unique global solution and the energy on the solution is conserved and it's it's finite. Also the functions QK will describe the, the coordinates of the oscillators and the energies of the thermostate they are bounded along the solution. Actually these functions are, are more the uniformly continuous. So let me skip uh, let me let me pass fast to this slide and then what is important I assume some assumptions on the 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 set lambda uh, of, of oscillators which interact with thermostates. So uh, 
Yeah, I apologize for this picture because I didn't pick you. It, it suffices to, to, to look at only items A and B. Only at items A and B. So let me explain on these examples, on these pictures, what is going on. Uh, I have the following assumption on the set lambda here by by white white balls this these are oscillators which interact with thermostates uh black balls they do not interact with thermostates so for example such such situations are okay for me if instead of this white ball i i had here black ball but i had one white ball in the middle of the chain so if i interact with thermostates if only oscillator from only one oscillator from the middle of the chain interacts with thermostates, it isn't okay. So what is going on? The point is that oscillators should thermostates should uh, normalize oscillators one by one. That is, this thermostate is this oscillator. This oscillator. What what means thermalizes means that it provides final dynamics which we want so it, it takes some energy from this from this oscillator uh, in the sense of the graph it means that that this oscillator which coupled with the thermostate may interact only with one oscillator uh, uh, which is not coupled with thermostate so for each oscillator coupled with thermostate we have we have only one oscillator uh, coupled with it, which doesn't couple to thermostate. So somehow this oscillator will thermalize this one. Then this will be thermalized, this will thermalize this one, and so on. Here's the same. This one will thermalize this one, this one will thermalize this one, this one will thermalize this one, and so forth. For example, if I, I, I can consider such, such structures, structures of three, but if you had one, one white oscillator in the middle of the graph, uh, instead of this white oscillator, then this white oscillator it cannot thermalize oscillators simultaneously, so it it, it doesn't suffice. So assumption on on I hope that, that it's clear what I mean. This is an assumption on on the geometry of the oscillators coupled to thermostates. And now main result which I already mentioned uh, under assumptions above. Uh, uh, coordinate of the this finite dimensional network of oscillators converge just to some fixed point and this fixed point uh, is a critical point of the effective potential this holds when time goes plus infinity and to minus infinity and the critical points can be different so somehow we start at one equilibrium and we can we can pass to another equilibrium and the choice of this critical point may depend on the initial condition also then the the uh, all time derivatives all time derivatives of uh, function q converge to zero when time goes to plus and minus infinity. So study of such systems it isn't it isn't a new thing. Uh, various infinite dimensional Hamiltonian systems uh, with finite energy were intensively studied and they they uh, they, they studied now. By Alexander Komich, just since the 90s, he, he, he worked really a lot on this subject. By he, but he used different methods and he considers quite different systems. So, for example, he considers like, like uh, strings on which you put some number of linear or nonlinear oscillators. And it seems that our methods and his methods are complementary. So, we discussed with him, and, and I mean, it isn't clear, it isn't clear. Uh, if one method follows from another or, or, or vice versa. So it seems that they, they are complementary because the system we consider are complementary. So uh, this technique that I use was developed by, by Trichov in 2010 and he proved just this theorem for the case when one thermostate interacts with, with one oscillator and oscillator could be linear or nonlinear. Uh, in 2012, I generalized this to the case when we have one thermostate which interacts with n oscillators, uh, but the oscillators should be linear, and the linearity is very is, is really is really important here. Uh, the, the case of nonlinear oscillators is much is much more complicated. And in 2017, a student of Trishov, Saulian, generalized the situation, not generalized, but but he he, he solved the problem when when 
n, there are n thermostates and n linear or nonlinear oscillators. So it means that each thermostate interacts with, with its own oscillator. Uh, and the, the, the number, if you have more thermostates, the problem becomes simpler. If you have less thermostates, the problem becomes more complicated. And then I just, just to, to this work, I just noted that, that the problem can be solved uh, if you have, if you relax significantly with this assumption, but if you use special geometry of the chain, so special geometry of the graph in particular, in particular, if it, the, 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 chain, the chain of oscillators coupled to two thermostats is okay. Uh, the last thing that I'd like to note is that, is that uh, our, this assumption on, on the geometry of the oscillators which are coupled with thermostates on this set lambda, this exactly co coincides, this is just exactly the same assumption that an assumption from, from paper of Kuner, Ekman, Heyer, and Ray Bile, where they considered like statistical mechanics counterpart of this problem, this problem with uh, thermostates of infinite energy, which I mentioned in the beginning, there they also considered network of oscillators, network of oscillators, uh, and they proved that, that the distribution of solution converged to the, to the unique stationary measure. Uh, and they also assumed that some of oscillators are coupled with thermostates and they assumed exactly the same assumption of this set. To, so it was quite, I mean, it was, quite nice because we just put on archive our papers, papers simultaneously and then it turned out that the, the assumptions are, are, are completely just are, are, are identical. So it means that this seems that this assumption is quite, quite natural. So my time is finished. So thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, are there any questions, comments, suggestions? Uh, Okay, I take advantage of being a chair and ask the first question then. Uh, can you go back to that slide with the uh, interaction potential where, where you define it as an integral, please? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, interaction potential, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So th this potential doesn't depend on the number of particles. So uh, the yeah, question. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This potential, so I, one oscillator interacts with one thermostate. Mm -hmm. or with zero <laughs> and for each oscillator you have its own thermostate for each oscillator that interacts with thermostate you have its own thermostate and no no other oscillator interact with this thermostate Th that's that's why here you have encountered only one thermostate and only one oscillator uh -huh. okay. and then then here you take a sum over all these oscillators which interact with thermostates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so, so it's, it's your usual story for, for such system in principle you can assume that 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 oscillators, then one oscillator can interact with two thermostates, but but then it becomes more technical and it seems that it doesn't make make sense to study such systems. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Let me see. Okay. Any other questions, suggestions? In this case, uh, we're going to have two minutes break. Thank you very much. Uh, it was most interesting. And uh, see you in two minutes. Слушай, подожди, я не хотел просто время занимать от доклада, так сказать. А ты можешь вот эти вот потенциалы, соответственно, выбрать. То есть вот если у тебя есть, соответственно, цепочка вот этих взаимодействующих осцилляторов, и вот крайне они взаимодействуют вот с этим термом ДФ. А вот между этими внутренними осцилляторами ты можешь выбрать потенциалы таким образом, чтобы когда количество осцилляторов стремится к бесконечности, у тебя бы был какой-то предел. То есть если бы количество этих осцилляторов было бесконечно. То есть хочешь у осцилляторов к бесконечности? Да, к бесконечности, но и параметры э, взаимодействия тоже зависят от числа осцилляторов, что получился какой-то scaling limit. Ну, смотри, тут в этих историях обычная проблема следующая, по-моему, что если, если ты хочешь слать, слать число осцилляторов к бесконечности, то тогда ну, у тебя два варианта. Либо у тебя энергия система будет расти к бесконечности. Mm -hmm. вот. а, значит, это, это сложная история, потому что это, это там, то, что называется гидродинамический предел, это, это сложная история. Про, простая история, если, если ты при этом держишь энергию конечный, но ну, там все проще, там возможно что-то что-то можно сделать. Нет, может быть можно подобрать специально специально 
такое, такое взаимодействие, чтобы, чтобы что-то получилось. Но здесь-то… Ну, да, да, но в принципе вот, вот, вот в моей задаче, в моей задаче она, она такая, там все-таки речь, речь конкретно о взаимодействии конечномерной системы с бесконечномерной системой и о том, что в ней появляется некоторая эффективная диссипация. Значит, бесконечная mm -hmm. радиации появляется некоторая эффективная диссипация в конечномерной системе. Но, но э, э, в принципе в, в, в ситуации гораздо более сложной, в общем-то, на мой взгляд, гораздо более интересной ситуации, когда у тебя настоящие термостаты с бесконечной энергией, вот как с начальными условиями, распределенными на мере гипса, на мере гипса, там результатов равномерных по n нету никаких. То есть, mm -hmm. числа астриатов, там нет никаких, никаких результатов, и э, результаты равномерные по n, вот я, 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 я что-то такое, то есть я рассматривал такие же цепочки, э, только когда у тебя каждый астриатор с своим термостатом соединен, не только, не только астриаторы с, кра с краев, а каждый. Вот в этом случае я там умею получать равномерные оттенки по n, я умею переходить ага. к пределам. В каком то смысле я умею переходить к пределам бесконечности? Mm -hmm. вот. Но если у тебя только крайний осциллятор, то, то это, это очень тяжелая задача. То есть это, это mm -hmm. то, что это совершенно люди не умеют делать. Ага, спасибо, понял. Так, да, это... Если взаимодействие как-то специально там подкручивать, может быть, что-то можно. Но, но в общем случае, в общем случае. Окей, okay. okay, yeah, I think we gotta uh, go on. And, uh... The second speaker of the last session is Irina Lukashova. Irina, are you here? Yeah. Ah, good. Thank you. Can you please show mm -hmm. up your slides so that uh, do, they, do they work? Oh, yeah, perfect. And uh, One uh, can, can you make it a full screen, please, also? Yes. Ah, okay, okay, good. Yeah. And so the next speaker is Irina Lukashova, and he's going to talk about uh, self-similar solutions to some difference equations. Irina, please. Uh, yeah, thank you for introduction. And thanks to our organizers for the uh, pleasure of participating in this conference. Today, I want to talk about self-similar solution to some different equations. And before I begin my talk, I want to say a few words about structure. At the beginning, I want um, to tell you about a question. I will say about different equations. Uh, for sigma function. Then I um, will introduce object. It will be logarithmic sums. Um, and after it, I try to um, um, explain a method for Gaussian exponential sum, sums, and then a few results, but not uh, whole. So my task was to start as a logarithmic sum one uh, with uh, uh, terms, with a number of terms n. We interested in a study uh, a big n. So it turned out that for its investigation, an important role is played by the solution of equation two, different equation two for sigma function. Uh, the one is interesting uh, itself by uh, for mathematical physics and has been widely studied in the works of Buslaev and Fedotov, and only Fedotov then, in, for example, in this paper. So let us to discuss sigma function. Note that uh, solution of this difference equation is the analog of gamma function, and the first one could be constructed in integral representation with um, uh, introducing of axillary function L node and theta node. And by means a uh, residue theorem, uh, we get a solution sigma in terms uh, of theta function, uh, which is a uh, holomorphic and uh, has no zero in a strip uh, S node. Um, the solution sigma is uniquely determined by its asymptotics on uh, imaginary plus minus infinity. And as well, we can obtain a chains of chains of zeros and pole for this function uh, by means um, this difference equation. We continue using it uh, how much step as we need. And um, there is zeros and poles we can see on the slide 
Uh, the solution sigma, uh, the k moment is the fact existence of second uh, difference equation for sigma function. This uh, difference equation three. Uh, or it's similar to initial uh, when we have had I when we have H here and only imaginary one here, but see the same. Um, so it's um, the special case is that of small parameter H, and then we have quasi-classical case, and uh, we have quasi-classical asymptotics. When we far from zeros on poles, the um, formula form is works work, and um, when we near zeros on poles, the asymptotics will include of um, gamma function. More you can see in uh, paper Fedotov, quasi-classical asymptotics for homogeneous fun function. Uh, so, as you can see, there is a lot of uh, proved facts for sigma function, but the question uh, about behavior uh, each along real line are open. Look at the exp expression on the previous slide here. Um, we see then if that uh, has a big real part, we can express it with um, through the function that with argument from compact, fixed compact, when we will uh, get a big number of steps. Um, such product is uh, analog of such sum. You see, if we get logarithm of this. So the question of asymptotics sigma function when real part z uh, speaks to um, infinity is the same when we will uh, investigate the product of a big number um, when we a sum of big number terms like someone. So the uh, the similar question was investigated in work Fedotov and Klopp in 2012. According to it, consider the sum five, its Gaussian exponential sum. Uh, by means computing, we can illustrate the behavior of sum on complex plane. For every n, we will uh, deviate a point on complex plane C and connect them with segments. The result we will call it graph of uh, the sum. Example for such uh, object we can see on the slide. Um, the graph resembles a spiral, you see, and furthermore, each curl, such curl, uh, has the same structure. We can see a zoom of the tail of the uh, left graph. Uh, that's why we have a structure, uh, a question about um, self-similarity. So for investigation, the Gaussian exponential sum, uh, the special function was introduced. Here, gamma is, um, um, here gamma is a contour along line L, L of psi. Uh, and, um, it turns out that F admits two different equations, seven and eight. I know that for sigma function, it's uh, important. We had uh, the same property. We had two different equations. That's, that's why all further theory will apply for investigation our main object logarithmical sum. So, also for F is now the representation uh, nine, um, mm -hmm. um, where F is almost a uh, Fresnel integral with uh, Cornu spirals uh, as the graph. 
fix uh, n and uh, a b from interval um, a from interval uh, zero one and b from such interval and um, let introduce such parameters new parameters uh, the braces is the um, fraction of this and uh, the uh, square bracket is a whole part of um, number. So then uh, the, the normalization formula works. It's the main result. And here are some of the big number of terms n and, and at the left uh, part of equation, uh, express through the same type sum, but the, with another parameters a and b, and um, the less number of terms n1. After continue, continuation this procedure, we can express a new sum in the such way. And then, then we, uh, obtain only differences of special function with uh, only different special funct functions will remain. Such representation is better for investigation because we know about special function f a lot. We know their asymptotics, we, we know a lot. And furthermore, uh, the quantity of terms will be less than in some uh, initial sum. Uh, so uh, now we express S through the F and it explains the self-similar structure because uh, sum uh, expressed uh, through the sum uh, e which has such structure, the same structure. This, is, uh, this observation allows us to investigate logarithm sums, we, which mentioned in the beginning of our lecture. Uh, here the sigma function uh, has a role of special function for Gaussian exponential sum. Existence of renormalization formula is consequence of two different equations which we have for sigma function two. Due to this fact, the renormalization formula could be obtained for logarithmic sum, formula 12. Furthermore, we also can continue this procedure and remain only increments of uh, uh, logarithm of sigma. And uh, number of it are essentially less than uh, number of terms in some S. Uh, a simple computing show that number of terms of uh, uh, increments is logarithm of n. Uh, so now we prepare to obtain asymptotics as for n uh, stick to infinity, infinity, but it's my task now and it's uh, not finished because of the quasi-classical asymptotics. Um, okay, sh one second. We had quasi-classical asymptotics for, uh, but uh, we, uh, we discuss logarithm of sigma function. That's why in asymptotics, we will have only uh, such fraction multiplied this function. This function is uh, here. So that's why the, um, the main meaning will be when h is small. But uh, when h uh, decreases, the imaginary part of that increase. And um, our sum uh, decreases exponentially, you see. Oh, you see here. And so now I uh, investigate fight between growing Z and decrease H. So let's see some pictures. One second. 
I want to illustrate the behavior of sums with growing n on complex plane. Each new point with number n of graphs is a value of sum with n terms. Here, it's result of such a construction, but uh, it's difficult to see different periods here. That's why we add linear term to every term in sum S uh, and um, obtain such graph. Here we also see self-similar structure uh, where each small arc, such arc, uh, is a only one term in renormalization formula. Uh, I mean that all these um, terms in sum is only one term in this sum. And uh, all these terms, which uh, make the next period, you see, it's only one uh, term in the second renormalization formula. So uh, I uh, investigated only continued fractions because almost I think that all rational um, numbers can be expressed like H here. And you see that uh, every small period is dependent on elements of this fraction. For example, the first period has four points. Four is uh, the first element of H. The second period has 10 uh, 10 first period, you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and etc. But uh, periods for H with element uh, 50 and 300, we don't see because in this moment, imaginary part of that is uh, very big and exponent is very small. Exponent in such expression, very small. Um, that's why uh, for to see more uh, periods, I want to I want uh, that imaginary part that is not decrease such quickly, and I take element less. Then I see all periods and also the last for nine. This period. Uh, is linked with uh, element nine. So uh, what I said to the end that for two, we have uh, again arcs, such small arcs. For next two, we have um, such pyramids. For next, uh, the pairs of such pyramids, which are, um, which are, um, show us uh, self-similar structure. And for nine such big periods, which uh, has nine pairs, one pair, second pair, and et cetera. So now I illustrated uh, the behavior of some and uh, want to say that uh, my next task is to, next problem is to discuss analytical why some uh, has such behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. Uh, are there any questions or maybe commentaries? Да, у меня такой вопрос. Я так я так поняла из доклада, что аж не обязательно рациональный, аж любой. Аж что-то меняется, когда вот мы рациональные или нерациональные рассматриваем. Ну, мы рассматриваем Аж, вы, можно на русском, да? Да. Мы рассматриваем аж из промежутка от нуля до пи на самом деле. И в этом промежутке рациональность или иррациональность числа зависит лишь от того, в конечную лицевую дробь оно сможет разложиться или в бесконечную. Ну, то есть ничего не поменяется? Нет, ничего не поменяется, просто вычислительные способности лично мои рассматривать бесконечные цепные дроби, ну, слегка затруднены. Нет, ну, может, какие-то аналитические результаты. Нет, в принципе, в идеале вообще 
конечные цепные дроби приведены лишь для примера, чтобы проследить появление различных периодов, но в идеале вообще должны рассматриваться бесконечные дроби, и уже вообще в чем суть? У нас вот получается, что мы сумму большого количества слагаемых представляем как сумму вот таких как бы остатков. И количество, во-первых, этих остатков гораздо меньше, а во-вторых, мы знаем их поведение, которое описывается вот такой асимптотикой при малых H. И дело в том, что у нас есть надежда на то, что в зависимости от того, как выглядит H, в этом представлении будет оставаться только их конечное число, и нам не придется считать всю сумму, а можно будет написать асимптотику, используя лишь конечное число вот таких слагаемых. Спасибо. Yeah, may, may, maybe just a naive question. And uh, th this problem itself, it comes from some other interesting, probably physical problem too, right? Uh, yeah. Why do you need this uh, analysis? Um, I can say only that such equation are really interesting in physics. For example, in the fraction theory, function of malusionate, uh, uh, their, their solution are constructed, construct, constructed with the solution of sigma function and the diffraction theory all constructed on such difference equations. Oh, okay. okay, gotcha. Thank you very much. Uh, so now we have a lot of time for a break and I guess it's just time for it. So uh, we'll come back here in nine minutes. Андрей, ты здесь? Да, здесь. Слушай, а, так, а сейчас вот я, я тоже, там времени уже не было, поэтому тяжело было уловить все, все детали того, что ты говорил. Вот а если у тебя а, все осцилляторы а, сопряжены с вот этой thermal bath, а, а, что, а, что упрощает технически, вот за счет чего упрощение происходит? Ну, а, сейчас, там... там. Как, как бы это объяснить? Как то есть у тебя получается э, вот это слагаемое дополнительное? Фактически, фактически, то есть на таком, на таком уровне происходит, по сути, а с другой стороны на уровне болтологии, значит, там, там э, если у тебя стрелятор связан с термостатом, то твой термостат забирает энергию. То есть, то есть uh -huh. производится, он, он, он играет роль какого-то какого трения, и uh -huh. из-за этого, из этого, то есть вот используя такую идею, можно показать, что, что все производные координаты этого осциллятора стремятся к нулю. А, понял. Вот. Если у тебя таких осцилляторов, значит, ну, чем, чем их больше, тем, тем проще. Если, если их мало, то, mm -hmm. то сложно. Но на самом деле, на самом деле вот, 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 вот это ключ, ключевой шаг. А, а дальше, дальше, если сообразить, что правильную геометрию достаточно выбрать, то дальше, на самом деле, там, там это небольшое дело э, ага. на ситуациях, когда у тебя, когда у тебя только часть осцилляторов взаимодействует термостатами, но нужно понять, вот, что, что геометрию нужно правильно выбрать. Если это понял, тогда mm -hmm. дальше, дальше там это технически не, не особенно сложно делается. Да, ну вот. то есть тут, тут не только геометрия, но еще именно количество термостатов, связанных э, с вот этой... Нет, нет только, 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 то есть фактически только геометрия. То есть тебе, mm -hmm. ты, ты, ты можешь вот этот процесс, что, то есть скажем, что астриатор термализуется, если, если э, ты доказал, что все производные его координаты временные стремятся к нулю. Okay. Uh -huh. вот, значит, если ты это можешь доказать для осциллятора, для всех осцилляторов, связанных с термостатами, а дальше, если у тебя есть только один осциллятор, который... А, а, сейчас, возьмем осциллятор, который термализовался. Значит, возьмем всех его соседей. Если среди этих соседей есть только один нетермализованный, uh -huh. то он тоже термализуется. Вот, можно сказать, если есть два то тогда, я не знаю, как это показывать, видимо, видимо, видимо может, может такого и не будет не происходить. Сейчас, подожди. А ты в какой-то момент говорил, что если вот у тебя бе бе белый шарик в серединке, то он не да. термализуется? Да, да, потому что, да, 
Правильно, да, да, сейчас. Ага. Правильно, потому что сейчас белый шарик, он, он сам, сам термализован, так сказать. Белым шариком ага. все хорошо. Вот. А вот двух соседей сразу он термализовать не может. Ну, вот, все понятно. Да. Ага. Поэтому можно так как бы по, по одному переходить, тогда это, тогда это работает. Ага. Ага. Вот. Ну, в принципе, сама техника, сама техника работы, это так, 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 в общем, все дело с телепередованием фольги и, и фидеш перевязания фольги, в смысле вообще на функции, вот, координаты. Ага осциллятора, это получается, ну, получается какое-то распределение, и дальше, дальше используя энергию конечно, можно показать, что она нас достаточно регулярно, что она что на, на самом деле является функцией, что почти является функцией ZL2. А, вот. тебе, наверное, для этого и нужен интегральный вид взаимоде... потенциала взаимодействия, чтобы можно было... Не, ну, не то, что мне нужен интегральный вид потенциала взаимодействия, просто, просто это вид естественный, потому что какой, а. какой, какой, какой еще... Ну, просто какой-то за да, и согласен. Не, ну, ну, то есть, если, если ты хочешь описать, то есть там важно, что ты взаимодействуешь, то есть действительно важно, что, что на всех частотах происходит взаимодействие. Если не на всех, то все, все рушится. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Вот. А, 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 если хочешь на всех частотах описать взаимодействие, значит, понятно, что их нужно описывать с помощью какой-то плотности. Ну вот. да, вот. если надо. Это и есть, в общем-то, есть плотность. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Понял. Спасибо. Спасибо. Но на самом деле там, там введение, это, введение я делал все действительно, я про это, про это думал вот с, с этой стороны, со стороны сравнения конечной энергии и бесконечной, но, но фактически это все-таки совершенно разные, разные задачи. Просто в случае конечной энергии он, он к сатфизике, по-видимому, ну, судя по результату, он просто к сатфизике не относится. Ну да, это что-то удивительное, что какое-то такое равновесие с разными температурами на конце. Ну, это такая, ну, ну да, это такая просто неправильная модель для, для этого контекста поведения. Уродец мой. Ну, ну а почему? Может быть, вот то, что висит посерединке, оно, как говорится, тоже свое, как это, свое сопротивление температуре имеет. Ну, что-то такое, да, но все-таки все все как-то, как как видимо, это нужно по-другому воспринимать, именно как взаимодействие конечномерной системы с бесконечномерной. Ну, вот Комич этим прямо, прямо очень много занимался, но действительно другая техника. Но у него есть какие-то обзоры, в том числе недавние, в которых Который... Да, и он, 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 он еще занимался, занимался вещами с квантовой механикой, связанными, э, то есть он занимался квантовой механикой с этой точки зрения. Он вроде бы наверное, пытался, пытался вот эти вот скачки между энергетическими уровнями объяснять вот таким эффектом, что ты на минус бесконечности начинаешь на одном равновесии, а потом приходишь на другое равновесие. И это это как-то правдоподобно выглядит, то есть вот эти вот, по квантовой механике. Он там рассмотрел уравнение Максвелла с чем-то еще связанным. Короче, 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 это так, так красиво все весьма получается. Нет, а кстати, вот интересно, вот есть два качка, так сказать, там, ну, два заряда, пусть там один положительный, ну, так сказать, конечных. Вот между ними с большим сопротивлением что-то. Вот что будет, так сказать, за большое время? Да, если с большим сопротивлением, наверное, да. Не знаю. Ну, в общем, да. Это настолько большое, наверное. Да. Да, хорошо. Я надеюсь, что... Наташа, ты здесь? Да. Э, так, и вот Андрей, и Сережа, вот очень хорошо, что здесь. Тут возникла такая идея на ланчике, э, значит, идея такая возникла, что, может быть, нашу, ну, у нас будет конференция, я надеюсь, в 2021 году, я надеюсь, ин э, презенца, а, значит, а в 2022 будет в городе Санкт-Петербурге конгресс. А может быть, нашу конференцию попробовать сделать сателлитом конгресса? У нас франко и русская конференция. Почему нет? Ну, небольшая, но сателлиты не обязательно должны быть очень большими. А в чем удовольствие быть чем-то сателлитом? Вот, вот, вот это вопрос. Это так. То есть оно, конечно, можно. Вопрос зачем? А, сейчас, а почему это не просто, Андрюш? Нет. Так нет, я, у меня просто не, мне цель не, не ясна. Да, за, зачем? Звучит красиво, но какой, какой смысл? Так, меня выбросило из интернета в самый неподходящий момент. Нет, нет, никакого неподходящего момента нет, мы обсуждаем это, эти соображения. 
А когда, кстати, этот кон конгресс будет? Я точно не помню по времени. В 2022 году, по-моему, точное время не определено, но, мне, но сателлиты могут быть по-разному относиться. Зачем? А, ну как зачем? Но... Это по времени не сдвигает, да, эту историю? То есть, то есть можно делать другое время? Потому что ну, если конечно, нужно... ну, конечно, ну конечно, да. Но было бы странно делать в одно и то же время, согласитесь. И зачем он так хочется быть чьим-то сателлитом? Все, больше нет возражений. У меня возражений нет. Я вообще Если сторонник союзнических отношений, Ильдар Абдулович. Нужно понять, зачем это просто совсем. Если есть какой-то какой в этом смысл, то может быть. А если нет, то тогда непонятно. Так, ну, наверное, надо продолжать. Ну, смысл в том, чтобы дружить, так сказать, дружить. Потом можно будет... Э как сказать, если мы захотим как-то продолжать, это можно... Ну, в общем, не знаю, мы же, если захотим это как-то продолжать, потом могут понадобиться какие-то ресурсы, которые, может быть, будет легче получить таким образом. Mm -hmm. Нет, ну, эта конференция, слава богу, хороша тем, что она, в общем, не ест ресурсы. Ну, вот... Да, конечно, можно там с большей помпой, но... Нет, 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 нет. Помпы я... Помпы, помпы надо достаточно. Проведи, проведи сначала конференцию 2021 года, а сами решите. Да, вот. А я не уверен, что вот тогда, может быть, будет уже поздно подавать на это. Это надо подается сильно заранее. Ну, вопрос, насколько это трудоемко, если это... Не думаю, не думаю, что это очень трудоемко. В каком-то, Саша, в каком-то смысле мы, что ли, и сейчас не то чтобы сателлиты, но как-то э, мы приписаны к какой-то там вероятностному семестру в Петербурге, но... Вот и очень хорошо. Тем более. Вот, нет, ну, нет, да, мне кажется, это... что это полезно. Мне кажется, что это полезно, коллеги. Это... Мне кажется, что это полезно, и мне кажется, что это не должно быть особенно труда. Может не получиться, но мне кажется, что это не должно быть особенно труда. Ну, Во всяком случае, это привлекает внимание конференции. Золотые, Паша, слова. Вот я все ждал. Кто-нибудь скажет это или нет, Паша, вот без вас мы бы пропали. Кстати, за книжку большое спасибо. Mm -hmm. Да. Но это мы, может быть, обсудим в конце. Ильдар Абдулович, кстати, нету там ничего про Кардана в этой книжке. Да нет, там, 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 там только Лапсафи Ферма. Нет, там еще кто-то есть, но Карда... я забыл уже кто, но Кардана нет, во всяком случае. Да, а Кардан, и... а Кардан в этой в исторической очереди Венденко должен быть. Это я не проверил еще, признаюсь. Это еще не... а, коллеги, а у нас еще один доклад. Да, да, надо... Конечно, а кто спорит с этим? Конечно, конечно, давайте, да. Да, 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 да. мы не спорим. Понятно. Здесь? Да, да, я здесь. Меня слышно. Да, да, вас прекрасно слышно, только пока не видно. Слышно, Ваня, Да, слышно. я думаю, меня даже и видно сейчас. И видно вас, да. Вас видно, а, да. а слайды ваши? Секунду, я а не успеваю. Угу. Okay. Так, я предполагаю, что сейчас и видно, и слышно, и экран. Да, да. Окей, the last but not least speaker of uh, this session is Ivan Alexeyev, and he's going to talk about discrete, quasi, infinitely divisible distributions. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for introduction. And before I start, I want to thank all the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. And uh, today I'm going to talk about discrete quasi infinity divisible distributions. Uh, here you can see a plan of my speaking. First, I'll uh, define this class. Then I'll show you a small example. Uh, in the third part, uh, a few words about previous results. And finally, new results. Uh, proven by uh, Hartov and me. Uh, first, I'll remind you a definition about uh, a definition of infinity divisible distributions, just one of the equivalent. Um, distribution is uh, infinity divisible if uh, its characteristic function has a levi hinchin representation. Uh, gamma is a real number, a is greater or equal to zero, and nu is a measure such uh, that this integral is finite. Uh, I'm going to speak in about uh, quasi-infinity divisible distributions. Uh, roughly speaking, um, they have this representation, but nu is a signed measure. Uh, to be more specific, nu is a finite signed measure on this set for all r uh, greater than zero, of course, strictly greater than zero. Uh, and this integral is finite. Uh, I assume that uh, you know this, uh, that it is a total variation of the measure of the complex or signed measure. Uh, it is also a measure defined this way. Uh, so here you can see a small example of quasi-infinity divisible distributions. 
uh, we consider a two-point law, non-symmetric. Uh, without loss of generality, we assume that P is strictly greater than one half. It means that one minus P over P is strictly less than one. So we can consider a Taylor series of logarithm. Uh, this line uh, means that the total variation of our Levi measure is a finite measure. Uh, here you can see that uh, our logarithm has Levi Hinchin representation, but not all the coefficients are positive. So it's not infinity, divis infinity divisible, but it has the same representation. And um, I want you to note that this um, distribution can't be represented as the sum of uh, identically independent, uh, independent identically distributed variables. So it is far away from uh, infinity divisible distributions. Uh, moreover, it can't be represented as the sum of two uh, identical, uh, yes, identically distributed variables. Uh, okay, uh, now I want to talk a little bit about previous results. The big, the big analysis was first made in the 2018. Uh, Lindner, Pan, and Sato approved some uh, general results about this class. And uh, they um, concentrated on the distributions on integers. Namely, they proved a theorem about sufficient and necessary conditions and also prove, um, proved one theorem about convergence. Okay, uh, here we, can, we have f is a characteristic function of distribution concentrated on integers. Then f is quasi infinity divisible if and only if um, its characteristic function does not have zeros. And moreover, we have this representation. Uh, K is an integer number, lambda n are real numbers, and also um, this series converges absolutely. I, I mean that series of lambda n converges absolutely. It means that measure nu is a finite uh, signed measure on the real line. And also the total variation of this measure is also finite. Uh, so uh, we don't need to consider this integral uh, condition. It holds. It holds. Uh, also, they considered uh, con uh, convergence. Uh, they considered these types of uh, characteristic functions and proved this theorem. Fm and f does not have zeros then fm converges weakly to f if and only if these two conditions hold. Uh, I want to tell a little bit about the first condition. Km and k are integers. It means that km converges to k um, if and only if km equals to k for all sufficiently large m. Um, Okay, uh, that's all for previous results. We'll get back to them a little bit later when I uh, say about our own results. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about sufficient conditions. Uh, the question about sufficient and necessary conditions in the general case uh, remains open. We try to focus on the discrete distributions. Uh, here you can see a characteristic function that we considered uh, and uh, we proved that if uh, infinite of absolute value of f of t is strictly greater than zero, then f is quasi infinity divisible. And uh, moreover, we have this representation where gamma, oh, sorry, I need to tell about x. x is the linear span of uh, these coefficients. By linear span, I mean that um, it is the sum of something like rm xm, where rm are integers numbers. So it is a module, module. Gamma from x, uh, lambda x are real numbers, and also this series converges absolutely. Uh, it means that uh, the total variation of our measure is a finite measure. Uh, I want to tell that uh, these theorem generalize uh, the not previous theorem, but this theorem about 
sufficient and necessary condition. An interesting thing that we proved only sufficient part. Uh, but uh, what does it mean that infinite is equal to zero? Since uh, in a uh, case when distribution are concentrated on integers, characteristic function is two pi periodic. So it's not an infinite, it's a minimum. So minimum of absolute value equal to zero. It means that it has a zero. So the distribution is not quasi infinite divisible. Uh, so in that case, it's not only sufficient, it's also a sufficient and necessary condition. Uh, also, there is one more theorem that uh, I thought that I don't have much time and I decided not to write it down, but uh, this condition is also necessary and sufficient for one more uh, types of distribution. Uh, as I remember, it is an absolutely continuous distribution with the point mass. And uh, here we have our hypothesis that um, this condition will be sufficient for all types of uh, distributions. Uh, I mean that if uh, infinite is strictly greater than zero, then f is quasi infinite divisible. Uh, we now move to necessary conditions. Unfortunately, we proved uh, this theorem only in a special case when um, the support of our uh, probability distribution is finite. It means that characteristic function has uh, the following representation. Uh, then this condition is also necessary. And the uh, quick corollary, uh, if the support of our probability distribution is finite, then f is quasi infinite divisible if and only if uh, infinite of absolute value is strictly greater than zero. Uh, of course, this corollary not um, generalize this result uh, in a uh, general case, but uh, we try to move uh, in that situation, um, but wor we work on this situation. Uh, also, I want to tell about theorems about convergence. Uh, I'll start with some new definition. Uh, we consider these uh, characteristic functions, uh, fn, and also f, uh, where it is it has the same representation but without index n. I want to know that uh, we can assume that x, xm are the same for all characteristic functions. Um, we just need to uh, consider that we just need to assume that some coefficients p are equal to zero. Uh, that's all. Uh, here you can see one of the equivalent definitions of convergence invariation. And uh, we decided to generalize it a little bit. Um, the sequence fn is said to be convergent in in, with shift in variation to f if uh, this characteristic function converges to f in variation and a n tends to zero. And we assume that there exists uh, such sequence a n that this uh, function converts to f in variation. And uh, I assume that you can see here uh, an example of uh, why this uh, convergence is a little bit uh, better than just convergence in variation. If we consider this characteristic function, then um, it's not uh, converge in variation to f, but uh, converge with shift in variation. Um, why do we need that? Uh, I, I'll go back a little bit. Here you can see that Km tends to K. As I've already said, it means that Km equal to K for all sufficiently large M. But in our situation, we have this modulus, module. Um, let's consider the simplest uh, variant, X1 and X2 uh, equals to one and alpha respectively. Alpha is irrational number. It means that X is, is the set of numbers alpha M plus K, where M and K are integers. So uh, in this module, we can find a non-trivial sequence that tends to zero. And uh, uh, so we have these problems with the convergence with invariation. 
uh, here you can see this theorem. Unfortunately, we need to assume uh, this that this supremum is uh, finite. Um, the main problem with this assumption is that it depends on the logarithm of our characteristic function, but not on the function itself. Uh, we try to find an equivalent or sufficient condition, but uh, unfortunately we can't. So the theorem, if two holds, uh, then the following statements are equivalent. Fn uh, converges uh, with shift in variation to f. Um, second, it is gamma n tends to gamma, and uh, this characteristic function converge uh, in variation to f. And uh, the last, it is gamma n tends to gamma, and uh, lambda, ten, lambda n tends to lambda in L1. Uh, what does it mean? Um, the first condition means that, uh, sorry, it is equivalent to weak convergence when we uh, speak about uh, distributions on integers. Because uh, let's consider a n, uh, and a n is not an integer number. Then a distribution that related to f n, uh, sorry, to these then this distribution concentrated on integers minus a n. It means that it can't converge in variation to the distribution on integers. So a n is an integer number. Since a n tends to zero, then um, it equals to zero for all sufficiently large n. Uh, the second condition means that gamma n minus gamma is equal to a n. It is, uh, we wanted to prove this part that uh, it is the most optimal shift that we can make. And the third part, it is the generalization of these two equivalent terms. Uh, it means that we uh, generalize the previous theorems about uh, sufficient and necessary conditions and also about uh, convergence. But unfortunately, we need to assume this um, uh, condition. OK, I think that that's all. Uh, thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so anybody, questions? Okay, may, may, maybe again a naive question. Th this condition two, what is so bad if it depends on, on the logarithm? So why is it bad? Uh, can I answer you in Russian? Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. К сожалению, мы его не можем проверить, зная только сам вид характеристической функции. Ah, okay. То есть мы сначала должны ее разложить, а потом уже проверить эти условия. А хотелось бы, вот как, например, вот сейчас одну секунду, как мы имеем вот здесь, условия просто, характеристические функции не имеют нулей. А, понял, все, теперь, теперь, теперь сложилась в голове картинка. Понял, спасибо. Ага. So, anybody else? Questions? Comments? Uh, in this case, I'd like to thank the last speaker and all the speakers of the session. And uh, I'd also like to ask Professor Buferov to give the final words, uh, Sasha. Oh, Sasha, we cannot hear you. Your mic's off. Okay, excuse me. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Yes. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for being here in this difficult uh, time. And it's a great pleasure that it was still possible to run uh, the conference despite um, unusual circumstances. And in fact, uh, I'm deeply grateful to the St. Petersburg team 
to uh, Natasha, to Masha, and to Pasha specifically for making this happen, for taking all the effort. Uh, I am deeply grateful to the team in Bologna, uh, so uh, to all the computing team in the Department of Mathematics here, and also uh, specifically to the new organizers, to Professors Marco Lenci and Nicola Cozzi, who uh, helped uh, organize this. So our conference, uh, we, we managed to uh, get advantage from disadvantage. So uh, this conference, I can see participants physically located, uh, certainly in Italy, in France, in Israel, and in uh, Russia. So, and uh, excuse me if I forgot uh, some other countries. Uh, so, uh, the, I hope this continues and we are able to uh, expand uh, the global reach of our conference in the uh, future years. So I like very much that some of the talks are in Russian. So the issue of language in mathematics is always very subtle. There is a famous story, uh, apocryphal, but quite possibly true, about a meeting between Kolmogorov and Shannon. Uh, Kolmogorov, it is well known, did not speak English. Uh, so, uh, and apparently Shannon expressed his regret that they must communicate through an interpreter. And uh, Kolmogorov, uh, the legend says, answered that of the five world languages, he, Kolmogorov, spoke three. And had the same been true <laughs> about the interlocutor, the problem would not have posed itself. So I think it is important that there be many languages in mathematics. And Russian language uh, occupies a uh, position of unfortunate transition. If, uh, um, let's say, 50 years ago, Russian certainly was one of the world's languages uh, for mathematics, and in fact, even today, even I uh, met uh, colleagues in the United States, uh, specifically colleagues working in logic and in probability theory, the areas of Kolmogorov, and quite specifically in probability theory, who speak Russian well and who learned it in order to be able to read Russian papers. So this is certainly less true now. At the same time, Russian is one of very few languages in which uh, one can still publish a scientific paper. And uh, this, uh, uh, this, even in the 20 years that have elapsed uh, since uh, I finished a university, uh, this has become less true of French so uh, it is true that uh, I still read papers in French, but I certainly read them less frequently. And uh, papers written in the last 20 years in French, it, I can think of one that I actually owned. So I did read a paper in German. In fact, it was the paper of Tricomi that I quoted in the course. So the paper of Tricomi is written in German because it is for the anniversary of Kamke. So it is in Zeitschrift für Wahrscheinlichkeitstheorie or something like that, or maybe one other, and uh, which has since, of course, become Journal for Probability Theory. And uh, uh, the um, paper is, in fact, in German. But other than that, before, that is to say, a few days ago, I never opened a paper in German unless we talk about mathematics of the 19th century. So Russian is still not, fortunately, not yet there. Uh, as an opposite extreme case, one can quote, for example, Scandinavian languages. If, shall we say, Italian students read their first mathematics books in Italian and only starting, for example, with their master studies, they switch mostly to English sources. Scandinavian students uh, in Scandinavian countries, unless I'm mistaken, only very initial books in mathematics are translated from the English. And since English is a close language to Scandinavian languages, from some point they read only in English. So, and uh, uh, Russian is going that way, and I hope it is not going fast. I think it is important that mathematics be done also in Russian. It is important for our school, and uh, uh, I hope this also continues. So, uh, and uh, of course, again, 
let us hope that collecting the advantages from this year and keeping the international participation and especially our friendly interaction with our Italian colleagues, we can meet in 2021 in St. Petersburg. Thank you very much. May I add a few words? No, 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 no. Yes. Okay. I have. Re I would like to remember to uh, remind you that this conference has been initiated by uh, Natalia Vasilyevna Smarovina and Alexander Igrish uh, Bufetov, and they have continued them. So we have to thank them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> and let us hope to continue in 2021. Вот давайте, давайте, конечно, в 21 году, да. Давайте, да, да. Да нет, ну, по-моему, что хорошо получается. Да, слава, очень замечательный доклад. Да, если в 21 году, кажется, это будет пятое под таким названием. Нет, постойте, как же пятое, когда шестая? Нет, пятое, пятое. Пятое сейчас, мы же начали в шестнадцатом. В шестнадцатом была Памимиан. Это другое. Ну, там, да, но... Она именно там, там и зародилась, это правда, но, но, да, но, 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 но первая была в семнадцатом. Александр Юрьевич, у вас не только время, у вас даже натуральный ряд другой. Ну, видите, а натуральный ряд другой во Франции. Я, Ильдар Булч, я же французский математик. Натуральный вот, ряд вот, во Франции я, другой. Я про это и говорю. Вот. вот вы сразу это можете увидеть, конечно. Да, да. ну, в общем, он считает, я понимаю. Конечно, да. Нет-нет, но пятое, но я считаю, что пятое у нас состоялось. Мы считаем, что четвертое, ладно. Пятое, ну, у нас могут быть небольшие различия. Хорошо, ну, значит, про сателлита, друзья, давайте про сателлита подумаем. So, Nicola.